Did you know that you can watch the next Femme Forte episode one week early on the Stride TV app? Use the code Femme Forte to get 50% off your Stride TV subscription for exclusive videos and live streams and to chat with me and our incredible community. That that has been the challenge in my life is to find ways to let my students know that it's okay to take risks, that it's okay to explore other avenues in their lives that are non-traditional. Welcome to Femme Forte, a place where we have real conversations with influential female music educators and performers. I'm your host, Amanda DeFries. On today's episode, we are joined by someone who changed my life forever. Dr. Elizabeth Jansen is a native of Newfoundland, Canada, and currently serves as the Associate Director of the School of Music at Texas A&M University, Kingsville. Dr. Jansen is someone who has supported me since day one, and now it's my turn to celebrate her. Well, I want to say thank you so much for being on the show and being a part of the early stages of this. I am so, so excited. I have been hyping this up (laughs) all week, and I'm just going to jump right in because I've told everybody I know at Team EA today um, that this is full circle. Full circle because... If it wasn't for you stopping me at Team EA for Jump Camp, none of this would have ever been possible. And I really, really want to dedicate a lot of this towards you and, of course, my passion for music. But that moment has changed my life. And the fact that we're back here at Team EA, it's oh, it's just I, there are no words to express how impactful you have been to me. And I'm so excited to be able to have a platform to highlight you, highlight your story, and and talk about these important things. So thank you so much. Well, before we go any further, I, I really have to say I'm, I'm deeply humbled that you feel that way. Um, I, I think as a teacher, we spend so much of our time reaching out and helping and, and we're happy to do that, but every once in a while, someone turns around and really says a heartfelt thank you and lets you know that it really is all worthwhile. You know, everybody has bad days and sometimes you're just like, oh my gosh, what am I doing with my life? But um, you mentioned that when we spoke yesterday as well, and I was honestly shocked. I had had no idea that that conversation had had such an impact on you. And I'm really grateful to you for letting me know because it doesn't happen very often. And, and every time that happens is so impactful. Oh my gosh. You're going to make me get so emotional. <laughs> right now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no you're good. You're, you're good. I, I literally could, I'm trying to hold back the tears of joy right now because I, I want to talk a little bit about that. And and to kick things off, um, I want to show you this picture. Oh, and no. <laughs> no, it's a great picture. <laughs> okay. I promise you. Um, so, so speaking of, so for those that you, of you that don't know, um, there was this camp um, named Jump Camp, and it was specifically for um, – females going into their senior year of high school and it was a day where you uh, a whole week during the summer where you get to basically live your life as a music major at Texas A&M Kingsville and that was really the point not only was I absolutely sure I wanted to be a music major but two it was so cool to be in that experience and really get a taste of what my future is going to be like and I deep dove into my google photos oh no (laughs) <laughs> and I found this, and this uh, for those of you who are li- for those of you who are listening, it is a picture of that last day of jump camp with all of us, like just so like kind of like hurrah! Right? And and I found it, and I just thought that oh my gosh, this is the perfect thing. I need to share this with you because again, bittersweet, full circle. That's great. And so oh, we, I hope you'll send me a copy of that. That's oh, yes, really terrific. Oh, yes, 100 percent. A little trip down memory lane and oh, I couldn't have been more proud. So I, along with that picture, I found like the picture of my like the drum <laughs> set that I was like in the rehearsal room. And for. the really nasty carpet in our old music <laughs> yes. building, like suit, like super nasty, like green. Yes. Um, and so Lo- uh, well loved carpet yes, right there. Well yeah. loved. It was honestly when I heard that jump camp no longer existed, I was like, oh my gosh. Even my parents was like, that was such a good camp. And again, a very 
core memory of my life. So can you tell me a little bit about, uh, like go further into detail about what Gemp Camp was, how the idea of it started? So I, I actually um, can't take credit for any of that. Um, I came in at a time uh, where, and, and some of this is my understanding of it. So um, uh, Dr. Melinda Brew, who's one of our voice professors at Tomek, she was one of the people that kind of brainstormed this idea, this idea of uh, a music camp that would be empowering for young women who loved music but weren't sure yet if they wanted to make that their careers and wanted to she wanted to give them a taste of what that might be like so they they had a chance to experience it and um, so she and my predecessor, the previous flute professor at my school, I think originally started the camp or came up with the idea. And so when I came in as the flute, as the new flute professor, Melinda asked me if I'd like to join in and participate. And I can't remember if it was the first year that I started or if it just kind of developed this way, but eventually I took on more uh, administrative, more of an administrative role with the camp and was helping more with um, how it was being run and so on and so on. But uh, Melinda, for the most part, was um, the, the instigator for that particular camp. And it was something that was funded by a, a, a service learning project grant that Melinda would write each year. And that's where we got the funding for this. But as the um, uh, as expenses changed over the years and uh, funding choices for the university went in different directions, uh, we weren't able to continue the camp in that way. But, you know, I always think about it every year it was stressful and there was a lot of organizing and every year it's like, oh, why am I doing this to myself? But, um, it, it was really important and I know that and and it was a I, I think it really had a terrific impact on a number of the students that we got to then see and follow for several years and even I ran into someone at TMEA but I uh, oh no I ran into someone on flute tour last fall we toured with the studio up into the Bernie area, I think it was. And a, a woman came up to me and she said, Dr. Jansen, I don't know if you remember me, but I was a jump camp student, like must have been back in 2013, 2014. And she had chosen not to pursue her music degree at Tomic, but had gone elsewhere, but still came up to me and, and really emphasized for me how important an experience that was for her and how it changed her life. And, and that was so rewarding to see that. So every year I, I think about it and I, I wish that we could um, find a way to bring that back somehow. And I'm sure that Melinda is thinking about it every year as well. So one of these days, yes, it will come back. We just have to find the right person and the right avenue for funding, so. Yes, and again, I, I mean, one of the biggest reasons of starting this podcast, having this voice on this platform is starting this conversation back up again, not only highlighting amazing women like you, but also just sharing these amazing stories. And and one, one that is super personal to me is Jump Camp. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this conversation needs to happen. More camps like this need to happen, not just, you know, with Texas A&M Kingsville, but with other universities. I very much um, agree that this is something that everybody should be doing because it was certainly impactful to me. Um, one of the things, uh, for instance, Angel he, uh, Jimenez, mm -hmm. she's, she's here and she was the same year that I went to that oh, camp. Really? Yeah. And so, you know, it was so nice to see her again and, and uh, we're not close friends, but we still keep on touch like on social media. And uh, one of the campers, her name was, um, Diane, Diana Guerrero. Guerrero, yes. yes. Yeah. She was my roommate for a period of time, like in the dorms. Oh, really? And so we had, when when I found out she was my, my roommate, we were like, oh my gosh, didn't we meet each other at jump camp? And like, just that connection and, and also being able to meet the professor of your instrument mm -hmm. ahead of time. Uh, so I got to meet, um, you know, Randy Fluman and, and Dr. Jason Keeley. And so when I got there, you know, going into college, uh, and making that transition from a high school senior to a freshman, you know, in college is very, very daunting and, and very scary. And, and certainly 
you know, kind of, as you said previously, having the connections of campers who went with you and, and upperclassmen um, who were there. There are two vocalists um, that were the camp counselors and they were still there when I entered as a freshman. So kind of them already seeing my face and, and almost being like that big sister and kind of helping me again, super impactful, super well, important. That was, that was done um, intentionally. So when we hired the student counselors, um, we asked that they the, that the people that applied would be still there with, when the jump class theoretically then entered school um, a, a year or a year and a half later. So we specifically selected them because we wanted that to be part of the journey, that you met these people and then you had an opportunity to interact with them uh, yet again a short time later and maybe under different circumstances. But while you were talking... I'm going to turn the tables on you. Sorry. I'm sorry <laughs> if this is not allowed. No, you're uh, fine. But, you know, we, as I said, we, we developed the camp as, uh, in a way, as a way to let female students know what it was like to have a music experience, uh, uh, like be a day, a week in the yeah. life of a music major. But it was also intended to empower, you know, to, to, Take a, allow young women to take a look at uh, what would happen in university and who they could be as university students and how they could make a choice in their lives. And you have brought me here because this camp was so important to you and you started in music, but then you chose a different path. And uh, I would like to hear more. Sorry, again, turning the table. No, you're fine. Uh, I would like to hear more about how Jump Camp helped you with that from a completely non-musical perspective, because I think that is also a really important part of what Jump Camp did. You know, it. I'm, I'm so glad you asked that, because even in, you know, again, music things aside, just being in a, a room full of women that was very impactful to me. Never have I ever attended a summer camp, band camp, anything that was just women. And so it was super uh, a safe environment and it was nice to be able to connect with so many people on a different level. And, and to your point, yeah, it did make me, I, I certainly think it is a part, a large part of who I am today. And so um, not only seeing strong women like yourself and, and Dr. Brew, um, you know, start this whole thing and, and do it all y'all selves. Um, but yeah, it certainly struck a chord in me to be like, yeah, F this, I can do this too. <laughs> well, I am delighted that was the message you got out of the camp. And um, we're, su we're super excited that you have embraced that and had such a um, varied and diversified and interesting and successful career. And, and that's exactly what it was for. So thank you for making it work. Of course. I, like I said, I, I really hope not only does this podcast provide listeners a safe space to relate to and, and start this conversation, but again, important opportunities like this just need to happen. And as, it, as I am a huge advocate for it, um, obviously mentioning what three times now, like <laughs> I hope that someone out there listening can be like, okay, like let's get this started. And then it becomes, you know, the butterfly effect. That would be terrific. That, yes. That would be truly amazing. Yes, absolutely. And and I appreciate you um, with your kind words. That that certainly means a lot to me. And, and I was telling Jack earlier today, like you have been – a huge part of my life, not only from the jump camp perspective, but I also grew in the media field a lot um, with doing um, the Selena tribute music video. Mm -hmm. oh, and that's the, terrific. And the Jimmy <laughs> Fallon yes. um, Call Me Maybe. Yes. And that was so fun to work on. And then even before that, my early days, when we were in that old recital hall and you had performed Legacy with Dr. Lee. Oh, wow. I'm working on that right now. No, way. yes, yes. I'm performing it next weekend. Oh my gosh! That yes. is, oh, that is such full circle. That's moment. crazy. <laughs> yeah, I had I, no idea it had such an impact for you. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it, when I decided to pursue the media field, that was my 
entry ticket to the door was let me record performances because that was something that's that, right yeah that was a gap that i noticed in specifically in our music department and i'm sure it existed before me but um i was like no students professors they i'm sure that y'all are sending video submissions somewhere and, and want to have um you know the memories to look back on or at least something to add to your portfolio mm-hmm. so um as i was getting more into photography and videography i was like no i want to offer this to the department because i think it would be a huge help. And so I was there, what, almost every week doing one to two recitals a a week. And then eventually, you know, uh, reached out to you. And and that's how we got, um, we did like quite a couple of runs. And and at the time, just thinking that was my mom's like point and shoot camera that I like, you know, (laughs) again, it's, it's nothing, you know, close to what I have now. But even just me with my little, my mom and dad's point and shoot camera and, and just hitting record and, and editing, like it, it just from seeing that baby me, like, again, huge part of my life. And, and I'm so grateful that you've given me those opportunities to not only see me grow in the music department, but also grow in the career that I'm doing now. Absolutely. And yeah. So- you have such a talent for it. I'm serious. It's, it's so easy to support others when they are as talented as you are. So I, I'm, it's, it's a given. Well, one of the things I, I like about you and I think is very inspiring is you have a b- balance of both performing and education. So I, did quite a my number of research on you like in your bio and so you've performed with the Corpus Christi Symphony, the Laredo uh, Philharmonic, uh, your second flutist and the Victoria Symphony right, yeah. and you've done a bunch of chamber work. And so what made you decide um, you wanted to go more the music education route or you th- or what made you want to pursue teaching in general? Um, well, I think a couple of different things because the, the, I did teach before I came to Texas. So I spent uh, 11 years studying and working and teaching in New York City before I came here. And initially teaching started as, um, as a way to make some money, you know, like I, I living in New York, it's expensive and I freelanced a lot. Uh, I also uh, did do some teaching as part of uh, my my work study that went along with my doctorate. Uh, so I kind of dipped my toe into it that way. And then I did a, a postdoctorate fellowship um, called ACJW at the time, uh, which was a, a joint project between Carnegie Hall and um, the New York City um, uh, School Board. And it was about trying to find a way to engage professional musicians in classrooms. Because at the time, uh, funding for elementary music in New York City had declined and had been declining for several years. And so Carnegie Hall and, and the Juilliard School wanted to find a way to foster music education via the population of performing professional artists that were living every day of their lives in New York City. Uh, So they developed this fellowship that supported us as performers, but also uh, in return, we went into New York City public schools and we taught as teaching artists there. So I got a chance to um, kind of look at a different aspect of teaching because that wasn't teaching flute. That was teaching a seven-year-old about Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and you had to get creative about how you did that. And, and the New York Philharmonic, or sorry, the Carnegie Hall was really supportive with that and gave me a lot of skills. And then that led to me being a teaching artist for the New York Philharmonic. And so I did that for several years. Um, but those were all part of my freelance career. So as a freelance artist in New York City, I was, uh, performing random jobs as an orchestral musician. I played with a regular ensemble. I did my private studio teaching. I did uh, teaching artist work for uh, several different organizations. And I taught at Manhattan School of Music pre-college. So you have like six or seven jobs at the same time, yeah. which you're juggling. And um, and it's, it's pickup work, right? It's yeah. not a salaried employment. So after a few years of that, um, I decided I was kind of ready to maybe 
focus on one aspect of my career and I had gotten a doctorate so I started applying for jobs and my husband is Texan he's from San Antonio okay. um, so when this job in Kingsville opened up this was a really great opportunity for us so I took that and that was my first college job like I it is my first college job for, first and only college yeah. job um, and it's interesting because I think that working there really allowed me to blend all of those skills that I had worked on and developed in those years in New York because I was still performing. I still played with chamber ensembles. I still played with orchestras. Um, I wasn't working as a teaching artist anymore, but uh, some of our students come in with very basic musical skills. Um, they might struggle with reading rhythm, or they might struggle with aural skills or theory skills. And um, I was able to teach the flute, but also work on helping these students understand classical music in different ways. And so my teaching artistry in that way got exercised um, all in one job. And I didn't have to spend so much time on the subway any longer. So <laughs> that helped too. Yeah. And so... Uh, so then I uh, I remember, you know, at, through a lot of various projects that we did, I just randomly one time scrolled on Facebook and then found out that you're the new associate director, director for the School of Music. So I've been dying to ask you, how did that opportunity come about and, and what was that transition like for you? Well, the transition is still happening <laughs> and it, it is has high, ups, highs and lows. Yeah. Um, that kind of developed as a surprise and maybe I was naive, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but, um, in the fall of 21, uh, it was announced that the college of arts and sciences at our university wanted to do some internships for faculty who were interested in administration. And, um, I, I had some room in my load and so I, put my hat in the ring and I was accepted to be an intern um, for the spring. And some other faculty were accepted to be interns in the fall. But I just thought that this was a career development, professional development opportunity. I didn't think that this was going to turn into anything immediate. But then in January of 2022, the director of our school of music, Paul Hageman, announced that he was retiring. And this was a shock because he had been at the school for 39 years. Wow. Yeah, 39 years. Um, and I think he'd been chair or director for 30 to 35 of those 39 years. Oh, my like, goodness. It was epic. So... Uh, all of a sudden, I realized, oh, okay, th this is a thing, and this is happening. And there were some aspects of the job that really interested me, like advocacy, like having a platform for from which I could maybe suggest and make some changes. That really appealed to me. Um, trying to find ways to organize and make more efficient some of the um, the red tape that comes with administration at the school and make things clearer for our students and more accessible for our students and more engaging for our students. So uh, all of that appealed to me as part of the job, but there were other parts of the job that didn't appeal to me, like um, uh, fundraising. Um, or even, uh, this is going to sound, we might have to edit this part yeah. out, but dealing with faculty. <laughs> yes. so I, 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 I didn't know that that was something that I wanted to manage, but luckily for me, uh, the, it turned out that they were, there were going to be two openings. There was going to be a director of the school of music and an associate director of the school of music. Um, so I, I talked with, uh, some of my colleagues who were interested and eventually it got sorted out. It came down to two of us. We were the two front runners. It was myself and Dr. Scott Jones, who's also our director of bands. And so Scott and I talked and, and we felt that different aspects of the job fell very well into each other's wheelhouses. And, um, so we, 
talked to the dean and um, the the faculty also had a say. We we gave presentations to the faculty and tried to approach the job from our different strengths. And in the end, uh, we were able to, we were given a lot of flexibility and we were able to kind of manage the job how we felt best suited our strengths and needs. But, you know, whenever you take a job, there are the compromises and there are lots of things still in my job, like paperwork, that I didn't necessarily become a musician to do. Yeah. Uh, so managing that has become, and balancing that, you know, you mentioned balancing at the beginning of this interview. I still don't know how to do that. I am still <laughs> figuring out how to balance um, the administrative parts of my job now with the teaching parts and the performing parts and the service parts, which are also important to me. So at different times of the year, the administrative part is 90% of what I do. And at other parts of the year, the performing parts are a larger part of what I do. And at other parts, it's the teaching. So I'm still working out, you know, it's only been four months that I've been in this job, um, how I can better balance that and make sure that no part is ever lacking, ideally. Yeah. And can I just say, I, when I found out that information, I, I think the two of you are, at, at least from my perspective, work really well together. And I could, could not think of anybody better who would be perfect for the role than yourself. Well, thank you. Thank you. We have, I've been really lucky. And so far, the partnership has been really successful. Um, and the faculty have helped a lot with that, too. We have a very tight knit music faculty. We know each other we, uh, really well. The, the, the town where Kingsville is, is rural. And so we not only work together, but we play together too. So um, our faculty have been really supportive of the transition and very helpful and very understanding because mistakes happen when that yeah. happens. Uh, so we've been, we've been very fortunate. And now a word from our sponsors. Ben Forte is sponsored by Ultimate Joe Book. UDB app modernizes marching band. Spend less time, have more fun, and achieve at a higher level. Just upload your drill from Pyware into the UDB app, and everyone in your band gets animations with your show music, precise pathways, syncs music, notes, props, and so much more. It's just easier. Head to ultimatedrillbook.com and use code FEMFORTE when you order to get 20% off UDB app pro. Now, one of the things is... One of my goals of this podcast is obviously to highlight you, your story, and, and where you're from, but also talk about the struggles we face as women in this industry. So have there been, you know, through your journey of your career, have there been any personal struggles you've faced um, as like a female in, in performance or in education? You know, I, I, I think one of the reasons why... I look so hard for ways to support my students is that I've lived this disgustingly charmed life. Like I, 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 I don't wish, but you know, I, I, I ha have had very few struggles that have resulted from me being a woman. And I think that's in part because of the instrument I play and the time in which I live. If that had, if I had been a female flutist 40 years ago, I think that story would be really, really different. Um, but because I was a flutist growing up in the 90s and studying in the early 2000s when um, really wonderful female flutists were a huge part of the professional scene, Jeannie Backstresser and Carol Swinsink and my teachers, Susan Hepner and Linda Chessis and Paula Robis and, you know, huge names in the flute world. It no longer was a man's world. And so for me growing up, and because I had super supportive parents who never even gave me a clue that maybe things might not go my way because I was a woman, um, it didn't really ever occur to me and then I came to South Texas and, you know, one of the questions on my interview, I was stunned, absolutely floored by this. One of the questions on my interview was about empowering young women. Really? 
Yeah. One, uh, I'm going to paraphrase it. This was not exactly the, <laughs> the question, but it had something to do with how would you convince a young girl who wants to study music, how would you convince her that it would it it's okay to study music, to leave home and go to university to study music? How would you convince her of that? And it had never, I mean, I literally, I, I wonder, I'm amazed I got this chat <laughs> because I had no answer prepped for that. And I think I made up some gobbledygook about, you know, um, letting them know about all the amazing female flutists out there. And I guess that worked. But it wasn't until I got to South Texas that I realized it really is a thing. Like, in our region of the country, um, I think that uh, women are not as uplifted as they are maybe elsewhere in the country. And I think they haven't been given as many opportunities and they haven't been given as many outlets to exercise their rights and their freedoms and their dreams. And that has become really important for me. So I guess to finally answer your question, that that has been the challenge in my life is to find ways to let my students know that it's okay to take risks, that it's okay to explore other avenues in their lives that are non-traditional, um, and that it's okay for them to be themselves and solve problems and think critically and um, be engaging and assertive leaders in their field. Yeah. And and one of the things I, I want to tell you is while I was recording other people's recitals and some of them happened to be some of your students, I remember um, seeing the just the support and the love in your eyes. And that's Aww. I I, I, I truly yeah. I truly mean this. Like, I remember, you know, obviously I do my thing of telling the student like, OK, I'll give it to you, you know, X amount of days and takes this much processing, you know, business things. But but I, I truly remember like you, you were one always there for your students when they would perform and and you would and, the, and how you would approach them after they performed. Like, I, I don't know. I just completely adore that and that's super inspiring and that's how you truly know like you're 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 super passionate and love what you do and and so um yeah I just want to tell you that because I that is a, also another core memory of mine while being at the university that that I witnessed in you and even more adds to the fact of why I wanted you to be here well thank you very much of course so you talk about you know how important it is to your students to take risks and 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 be out there and 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 all that. And so, one of the things um, while doing my research on you is that you uh, were a part of the National Flute Convention and a part of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Um, it was called Nothing About Us Without Us, correct? And um, and that was one really cool to see and. Um, talking about like diversity and inclusion, it's it's certainly something you know. As time has evolved, um, everybody around the world is seen as something to include and talk about more. And so, I kind of just wanted to ask you, what does it mean to you to feel included? Oh, that's a such a great question, and that's exactly the question we asked at that clinic, <laughs> and I asked it, and now I have to answer it. Um, <clears throat> respected. I think it means feeling genuinely welcomed. I think it means feeling like I'm heard. And I think it means that, and this is maybe an ideal situation, this maybe doesn't happen every time, but that my basic needs are anticipated as part of a group, you know, and, and I, I haven't had as many challenges with that, but I have been in situations where uh, a colleague or a friend or a student with non-traditional needs 
that people know about um, have been ignored. And I think, I mean, I'll, get, I'll give you just a, a very, very, very silly example, because I don't want to, to use any more pertinent example or uh, serious examples maybe, but um, if you're organizing an employee lunch and you know one of your employees, or just, mm, no, let's put this a different, li- different way. You're organizing an employee lunch, caring about your employees or your colleagues enough to remember that one of them is vegetarian. You know, like that, that is not, a, that is not a physical need. It's not a, um, an issue of, it's not a disability of any kind, but I think it shows that you care about people and you remember something about them, that you care about them enough to step back and say, are everybody's needs taken care of in this? Instead of just being in such a hurry that you think only of the mass of people. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that Small things like that are part of what make a group of people as a whole feel like they are included and um, that the environment itself is inclusive. And it might not be a big thing. It might not be ADA required, but the act, taking the time to think about things like that, the extra things like that is important. And now I'm going to forget something. Just you watch. Like in the next six months, I'm going to forget something about someone. I'm going to be like, oh, I gave that interview and I totally forgot about something. But but I try. Right. And, and for me, th- that is that is inclusion. And so how do you think those same principles specifically apply to making women in this community feel inclusive? I think that, um, well, let's talk about being heard. You know, I think too often I've been in situations, I happen to be very loud. So usually people don't talk over me because I will talk (laughs) over them louder. Um, But I think that um, making an effort to ensure that everyone gets to have a voice, or even if that means asking, do you have something to say? Because maybe that person is not accustomed to being allowed to vocalize. Um, There is a terrific program right now at um, not my school, (laughs) at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. Good job, guys. Um, They have free tampons and pads available in every bathroom on campus. That's amazing. It's amazing because uh, we live in an area of the country with Uh, a demographic that tends to be low income. This is a basic need for women and it is being provided. And it's, you know, you don't have, well, maybe there were people, but you don't hear people saying, well, people are just going to take advantage of it or they're going to steal or whatever. No, it's, it's the honor system and it's being honored and it provides people with an intimate item that maybe they are not comfortable purchasing or um, or they can't purchase financially and don't feel comfortable asking for. Yeah. Um, so projects like that, I think, are really crucial. And universities should be leading the way in that because we are members of the community. We are leaders in the community. And when you see an example being set like that, then students at those universities and guests at those universities feel included and then look for ways to make their communities feel more inclusive. And it rolls from there. Exactly. And I love that you're so passionate, not only about inclusion, but empowering women. I mean, I see you as a very strong and empowered woman and a, and a huge role model in, lo- in my life, at least. And, and so uh, what do you think the benefits of having empowered women um, in the music, music education space um, are? A variety. You know, I mean, 
at, at our university, the uh, motto of the College of Arts and Sciences, which is very diverse, like it goes from chemistry to music to art to history to lang lit, so on and so on, is diversity is our strength. And I, I think that is the perfect motto for the world. You know, uh, without women in music education, you would have a very two-dimensional perspective on what the needs of your students are and um, what the potential for music can be, either in terms of education or a performance or the emotional impact of music or the services that music can provide uh, to its community. Um, women and all parts of diversity, not just gender, but, but everything, that, that is what makes life exciting and a community vibrant. And it, it's so, it's just so, oh gosh, I wish I had the word, um, crucial going forward. I mean, that's the definition of music, right? It's yeah. a universal language, right. a universal language. So why would you have only one voice within that? I wholeheartedly agree that no, I, everything you're saying, I'm like, yes, please say more because goodness gracious, people need to hear that. And I loud and clear. And, and, and with that, um, what do you think are concrete steps that we can take to advance empowered women in this industry? Um, I think that uh, encouraging our young female students to consider music, like verbally encouraging them, not just through um, competition, but also giving them an opportunity to really be artistic and to be a little freer in how they view music. Uh, here in Texas, we have this amazing all-state system, and of course that's why we're all in San Antonio right now, it's for TMEA, which is the culmination of our all-state season. Yeah. Um, but it's very competitive, and Women are doing incredibly well in that environment, but it's also not always an environment that is supportive of women. And so if we could find ways to really help the creative side of the, the women in our music programs, I think that would give them uh, a different outlet and maybe uh, lend a voice to some women who don't feel com comfortable in competitive environments. Um, but speaking to them about the potential of being a leader in music, there are still many female musicians that grow up with mostly male band faculty. And that's improving, don't get me wrong. That, I mean, that is really improving and I'm grateful for that. Uh, but talking to my students, most of them have not had a head band director who's a female. You know, the person in charge yeah. has not been female. And I ask them in their lessons, why? And nobody can really answer me other than just circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so encouraging our students to say, yes, you can hold a baton. You can lead a band. You can direct, um, command, uh, engage, lead. Uh, inspire. You can do all those things as well. Yeah. Um, I think that music education is improving every day, but part of improvement is always assessing yourself. Right. You know, so every year we should be looking at our music programs and thinking, how can we reach more people? How can we reach people in different ways? How can we support people in different ways so that everybody feels engaged and inspired by this? And I think that that will um, help support more women in the arts.
Yeah, and and speaking to your point, just kind of going back to what you've experienced in your life, um, I had spoke about this with another guest that was on the show. Um, there is a podcast I listen to um, called Financial Feminist by Tori Dunlap. That I've been recently really into and super inspired by. And one of the quotes that she always says at the end of her podcast is, with privilege comes responsibility. And I think that applies very well in this situation, how you just said, you know, I, you know, been very fortunate to have people supportive of me, but then I realized that not everybody experienced the same way as exactly. that. Exactly. And, yeah. and so, you know, I was just about to ask you a question of what motivates you to still um, empower women and, and to be so passionate about it. But I mean, I think you kind of already answered it in the sense that, you know, you saw in your life that not really too many struggles you know, occurred, but in seeing your students facing uh, more adversity, um, it's super important to not only bring that confidence in them, but, you know, help them um, not avoid the struggles, but, you know, just be not afraid. Overcome them. Exactly. Yeah. And find solutions. I mean, I think that's the most important part that everyone faces challenges in their lives in some sh shape or form and it's up to us and as educators to help students develop the skills whether they're male female or gender neutral it's our job to help them understand that there are solutions they might not be obvious and they might not be uh, immediate but if we can be creative and if we can foster that in our students, then they can find those solutions for themselves. And that's what empowers people mm -hmm. when they feel like they do have the tools they need to solve the challenges that they're facing. Exactly. Well, before we wrap up, I have one last question for you. And are you saving the worst for last? Maybe. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, um, so throughout your career and, and, and having the knowledge that you have now, what is something that you wish you would have known um, as like when you just started Flute or even uh, hopping into, you know, Texas A&M Kingsville, it's your first real college job for the first time. What is, what is something you wish you'd have known or advice you would have told yourself knowing what you know now? You're gonna laugh a little bit, I think, at my answer, but I was just thinking about this the other day. I think it would be, advocate for myself more. You know, I talked to my former teacher, Linda Chessis, uh, a couple years ago, and I was telling her about one of my students who didn't take risks. And then I was telling her about something that I was doing, and I wasn't taking risks. And she says, you sound a little bit like your students right now. And I'm like, oh my God, she's right. You know, I think that um, I tend to be someone who prefers who doesn't necessarily like to advertise themselves. Yeah. I like to support others. I like to advocate for others, but I'm not very good at advocating for myself. And so I'm not really leading by example in that way. And I wish that I had had that conversation with my teacher earlier. And it's something that I'm still practicing. And Part of it, I think, is also because as musicians, as, as performing, maybe particularly classical musicians, we're constantly tearing ourselves apart. You know, in the practice room, we're like, oh, that B flat was flat, or um, that 16th note was not precise, or that articulation was sloppy, or, you know, we're constantly picking away at it. And so I, I don't think I took enough time to appreciate and vocalize for myself um, what I am good at and what my strengths are and how I can turn those into new pathways. And I think that I've learned from that and that I try to encourage my students to do that. But of course, you know, um, you're a lifelong learner. So that's an area that I'm still working on. And maybe this podcast will help me with that. 
I was just, I was literally just about to say that. I was like, well, I think you're doing a great job in making the first step as a podcast that where I- My first time. Yes, where I asked all about you. This is your time to shine. And I'm so humbled and grateful to be able to have done that for you. And so where can our listeners, our viewers find you online, website, social media? Oh yeah, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, Liz Jansen Flute on Instagram and just Elizabeth Jansen on Facebook. And I have a website, uh, elizabethjansen.com. It's all very, I have a reasonably unusual name. So uh, Jansen with a Z. Uh, so no one had stolen my website yet. Uh, and uh, of course on the Tomic website. So Texas A&M Kingsville School of Music. There are biographies about all the faculty. So you can find me there as well. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Femme Forte is produced and hosted by me, Amanda DeVries. Theme song is by Humans Win. Audio production cinematography by Jack Pentelio. For more information on Femme Forte, follow us on social media at Femme Forte Podcast and StrideTV.com. Don't forget to watch the next week's episode on the Stride TV app.